I'd like to talk to you about a vision for a future city for a post-oil society. But before I come to that, let's start right here. From the beginning, people have built shelter to separate private spaces from their environment. But at the same time, putting all these shelters in close proximity to each other, they created something which we today would call a public space. A space for communication, for interaction, a space in between the private spaces. And this space actually is crucial for what we call our settlements today, cities. Cities are actually the most successful way of inhabiting the planet. As cities are a human attempt to create a paradise on Earth as we substitute natural resources by technical means. Whenever we need water, we switch on the tap. Whenever we need light, we just switch on the light switch. So we have everything we need at any time we need it. Seen from a distance, cities take over the landscape. Urban sprawl, they already have become our second nature in which we live in. Seen from near, cities are built out of buildings, streets, they are very complex networks of a lot of elements which are testimony to human creativity and inventiveness. So they always reflect societies, culture they were built in, but at the same time they used to reflect the environment in which they were built. Our modern society heavily depends on the use of fossil fuels. We have built cities about anywhere in the world without being very careful about the environment in which we positioned our cities. And while more and more cities are built and more and more people inhabit the planet, our resources are declining. We need these resources for our cities to survive, but less and less resources are there for more and more people to use them up. So what can we do? Population growth on Earth is going up very, very fast. For the first time in history, more people live in cities than in rural areas. And by 2020, we need an additional space of two billion people, mostly in cities. But if we look to the world map, it is very evident that the moderate climates are taken up. They have long been settled. There are lots of areas being built up by humans. There is only a little space left where we need to accommodate lots of new people. How can we do this? If we look back to what we call the quantitative cycles of basic innovations, we could basically say that basic human needs always triggered innovation. So at the beginning of industrialization, food was widely available for people in the developed world at that time. What was the biggest demand was actually demand for clothing. And in order to fulfill this, the steam engine was invented. The steam engine provided power for looms. The steam engine made it available to produce clothing in a mass-produced way. The next need is how to bring it to the customer. It needs to be distributed. So mounting a steel engine onto rails allowed to transport everything to the cities where it was needed. And this is what we call the railway. So the railway was the next invention. People wanted to have smaller machines in their homes, household appliances as we call it today. That was only possible through the invention of electricity. A power net made it available to have all these machines, not as large central areas, but as smaller elements at people's home. The next step was actually for people to move freely whenever they want from their homes somewhere else. This was the invention of individual mobility. And the car is actually the most uh, important invention of that stage. There was a need to communicate with each other without physically moving from one location to the other. And this is how the telephone was invented. And we all know how mobile phones and smartphones have changed our lives. We can be in one place while talking to someone in a completely different location. The need to travel is not necessarily combined with the need to speak to someone. Well, what's left? There's only one desire left which we cannot fulfill at present. And this is something which keeps us very, very busy. It's the desire to live a healthy life in a healthy environment. So according to these cycles, we live in what you could call the health age, as this is the driving force for any technical innovation at the moment. If we go back to the buildings and the build-up environment, we can see 
that the build-up space has always reflected the technological inventions of the time. The Steel Age. The Eiffel Tower actually became the icon of the Steel Age. It probably is one of the most useless buildings ever built, <laughs> but it's still there and everyone knows it and it became a very important icon. Can you imagine Paris without the Eiffel Tower? The next invention is the skyscraper. Through the advance of electricity, we could light very, very deep buildings. Deep buildings where no daylight would penetrate at all. So we could build very deep buildings which became very high at the same time. And this was the skyscraper. Modernity, and for instance the Bauhaus, had the dream of building houses just the same way you can produce cars, a mass-produced good. If you look at these two, they're both designs of 1927. While the house still looks fairly modern, no one would dare to buy a car like this anymore. Still, they both come from the same desire to produce goods in a mass-produced mass way. The invention of the air conditioning made it possible to transport the skyscraper, to build it anywhere in the world, wherever you want, fully glazed curtain wall facades, like here, the Seagram building by Mies van der Rohe. It was possible to be independent of the environment. Then globalization, global communication. Suddenly, architecture became something that could be mediated. And probably everyone in this room knows the Bilbao Guggenheim Museum, as this became the single one building that put architecture on the map as something which attracts people to come and see a certain location. So you can create a destination through building. Now, what would be a building which corresponds to the health age? If we go back to the world map again, we look, we can see that the areas where a lot of population growth is happening at the moment coincide with areas with very heavy solar gains, which means these are very hot areas, but these are also areas where there's a lot of solar power available. So I'll talk a little bit about the Middle East, as the Middle East, for instance, a country like Saudi Arabia has a population growth of 2% a year, which means that even by now 80% of the population is below the age of 25. Mazda City is not in Saudi Arabia, this is in Abu Dhabi, but that is probably the first city to be mentioned here. It is a project designed by the architects Foster and Partner in London, and it's going to be the first CO2 emission-free city in the world. It is a city development not in the desert, but close to the airport of Abu Dhabi, even close to the Formula One track. But it actually set out to be something which is modeled after an ancient, ancient city model, a walled city. It's roughly the size is roughly one square mile. It will house 50,000 inhabitants and will provide work for another 40,000 commuters to come in and out every day. There will be no fossil-powered cars, there will only be electric mobility, and because the houses are built in a very dense way, they will provide shade for the streets, people can walk again. And what's even more important, the only energy going to be used is solar energy. So there are photovoltaic cells all over the roofs of this city. In the office, we were able to win a competition a couple of years ago for the city center of that city. Now, this was meant to be a conference center, but instead of providing a conference center, we pushed the buildings to the side and said the center of a city needs to be a public space. Because a sustainable city is only sustainable if there's something like social sustainability. And social sustainability means that you need to have a public space. A public space that allows people from very different backgrounds to come together and meet, to exchange ideas, to exchange knowledge, and to really feel at home in this city. But how can we do that? It's not a moderate climate. There are 55 degrees outside. And this public space should really be outside so that it's not controlled by anyone. It is not a shopping mall. It is a public space. Anything can happen at any moment. So the only idea, the only way to make this work is to build large umbrellas over this plaza that provide shade at the bottom, change the climate underneath, and harvest solar energy at the top. With the energy we produce at the top, we can use that to cool down the slab whenever that is needed. And in this way, we have a public space which is usable 300 days out of 365 days. People can sit 
and eat outside and meet. And what's important at night, these umbrellas have to close down to let the hot air out towards the sky and let the sky cool the plaza floor again for the next day. The conference center is actually pushed to the side. We'll be able, it is there, but it is not the, the piece that makes the city. Now, with this in the background, we were asked by someone, by another client, to have a look at this location. This is the location around Riyadh in Saudi Arabia. It's probably one of the most arid areas in the world, and as you can see, it's nowhere flat. It's a very fissured landscape with a lot of valleys cutting into a plateau. Traditional ways of thinking about city building would lead us to the conclusion it is absolutely impossible to develop anything in this location. This is what it looks like from close. And what you can see immediately is all the resources needed to build anything are not available. There is no water, definitely not. There is hardly any building material, as the sand and the rock you can see here is not suitable for building construction. But the only thing that's there is solar energy, and that are plenty. So what we need to do is we first need to produce energy so that we can export energy that allows us to import everything else we need, be it material, be it water, be it food. So the first thing that needs to happen is we have to build a huge solar power plant, which is the circular element you see in the foreground. At the same time, we have to think about the features of this landscape and how we can use minimal interventions with a minimum of material to make a big difference. So what we propose is actually, rather than going on top of the plateau, which is a very modern idea, to go into the valleys, to provide space in the valleys, in between the steep walls. And we can do this by just hanging a very minimal sail-like structure in between. And this would allow us to be able to moderate the climate underneath. While we're harvesting solar energy at the top, we block out 80% of the sun, we provide a much cooler environment underneath, and again, it needs to open up at night to uh, make sure we have the ventilation going on. But this bioremediation will create a climate which is rather than Saudi Arabia, is actually compelled to Madrid, to Beirut, or maybe even to Los Angeles. The span of something like this, it looks quite minimal, but it's 350 meters across. 350 meters is the size of the Millennium Dome in London, which at the moment is the largest membrane-covered structure in the world. It would only be the short side here, the long side being able to expand indefinitely. Well, now we're in the valley. How can we develop infrastructure for city development in a valley? As we see at the moment, technology is changing. On every level, everything is going to be more decentralized and going to be much smaller. So the basic ingredients for any city building, mobility, energy, communication, and water distribution, they're all fundamentally going to change. Instead of owning cars, people will have a mobility guarantee. We'll use integrated mobility systems, which allow us to switch between different modes of transportation to come from one location to the next. Instead of producing, building big power plants with huge lines, there will be a smart grid. People will consume energy, but they will also be able to feed energy back into the grid. And most of these elements will communicate with each other, so we don't need to separate spaces anymore for cars and pedestrians. This can all be done in communication. The car will actually detect something which is on the street and will smoothly go around. Water will also be able to get rid of these huge pipes which we bury underground and have rather small pipes with vacuum cleaning. So water sewage will use less water will produce less waste, and we can do this in almost any shape that is needed. So underneath the technological cloud, we can do anything we need to, to do to inhabit these valleys. So in the end, this is what it could be like. There's a cloud-like structure, like a protective shield, maybe comparable to the Earth's atmosphere, which protects the area underneath from the sun. At the same time, it provides enough energy for everything that is needed there, even more energy so that energy can be exported 
which allow us to import water and food. And at the same time, it will become a living laboratory. Any technological advance can be in integrated here. It will be adaptive, it will be flexible, it can change over time, and it can grow naturally. A new city, which is a system which works in harmony between the landscape which is there and the new technology which is available. Thank you.